Welcome. Another Public Interest Before Corporate Interest YouTube presentation. My name is Joseph Toscano. We're in front of the High Court, the Melbourne Division of the High Court, at the corner of William and Latrobe Street on uh, Wednesday, the uh, 13th of February. And our good friends from the Wednesday Action Group are here calling for a uh, Royal Commission into Corruption, which they've had done for for the last 20 years. Um, why here? What's a constitution? Well, a constitution is basically the framework on which a society is built. You've got a bad constitution, you've got a bad society. The Australian constitution was enacted in 1901, the 1st of January 1901. Before that, there was a 10-year debate in the states of uh, Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania and West Australia about whether Australia would be an independent, six independent states or whether they would federate. A referendum needed to be held in each state to approve the constitution. That referendum was successful and on the 1st of January 1901 the Australian state, independent state, was created uh, under this document. Now this is a very important document which actually regulates everything you do, whether you like it or not. It is a little bit like the Quran or the Bible or the Hindu uh, Vedas. That, they regulate what those believers believe in. The Constitution regulates our behaviour. Now the Constitution is a very small document which I recommend you read. It's only about 154 uh, uh, points. It's a relatively small document. And seven High Court judges are appointed for life, or until they turn 70. Now I've got a funny story. When they used to be appointed for life, there was an old High Court judge who used to sit on a commode chair for about 10 years giving judgments to his 80. So the law was changed and they've got to retire at 70. So it's the government of the day which appoints the High Court judges. So therefore you've got radical judges, you've got conservative judges, depending on the government of the day. And although you may vote out a government after three years, that person who's been appointed to the High Court can stay there till they retire. So some people are there for 30 years. What is the role of a High Court judge? The role of the High Court is to interpret the Constitution, interpret the words which are written down in that document. It's a little bit like being a priest or a pastor or a uh, imam. You have an interpretation of the words which have been written, not by God, but by human beings in this case. Okay? Now, Australians have a lot of inconsistencies in terms of the way they think. They think they've got all these freedoms. Now, the Australian Constitution is basically a document which regulates the relationship between six independent states and the federal government. And initially, when the Australian nation was formed, gained independence in 1901 as a constitutional monarchy, most of the power lay in the hands of the states and minimal power lay in the hands of the uh, federal government. For example, in 1917, just before the second uh, conscription plebiscite, Billy Hughes, the turncoat prime minister, was touring Queensland and at, uh, I think at Ipswich, a demonstrator threw an egg at him, splattered on him and he asked the local coppers, the Queensland coppers, to arrest this man. They refused to arrest him because they didn't recognise the authority of the central government. They only recognised the authority of Red Ted Fyodor, who was a radical premier of Victoria in 1917. So when Billy Hughes went back to Canberra, the legislation was passed to create the Australian Federal Police. And if you look at the cartoons of the period, you see this, this uh, silly looking copper being hatched out of this egg with a little slogan at the bottom saying, rotten egg, okay? Now the Australian Federal Police is an extraordinarily powerful 
organisation 100 years later. But up till 1917, the federal government had no way of enforcing legislation that had to rely on the states. Now, over time, the states have ceded power to the central government, the power to tax for taxation after the Second World War. Once they ceded that power, the state governments basically became more like large local councils because they've got no power in terms of forming treaties, international relationships, defence, security, etc, etc. So it all sounds pretty nice up until now. So let's look at the Australian Constitution. People have all these beliefs that they have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association in the Australian Constitution. Well, as I said before, the Australian Constitution is essentially a document which regulates the relationship between the central government, which is the federal government, and the states. There are no provisions in the Australian Constitution which protects the individual from the arbitrary exercise of state power. What that means is you don't have freedom from the state. In Australia, unlike the US Constitution or even the arrangements under which Great Britain works, the individual has the only rights the individual enjoys are the rights which the government allows them to enjoy. For example, there is no freedom of speech in the Australian Constitution. 20 years ago, the Australian High Court found that Australians had an implied right to freedom of speech during an election campaign. So there's no freedom of speech in the Australian Constitution. There is freedom of religion and there is uh, freedom to uh, uh, obtain compensation if your property is uh, acquired, possibly acquired by the federal government. So all these laws that have been put in place over the last 20 to 30 years have highlighted how little freedom there is in the Australian Constitution. For example, if you are a trade unionist and you are a member of the CFMEU, right, you have less rights than Tony Mockford, a convicted felon. You could be arrested for importing $1 billion methamphetamine to this country and you can say, when you'll be interviewed, no comment. If you remember the CFMEU, under the building authority, which is currently in place, if you refuse to answer questions, you can be imprisoned and fined. Let's look at the so-called anti-terrorist legislation. As an Australian citizen, you can be arrested and held incognito, hidden, for up to two weeks to be questioned by the authorities, not because you've committed a crime or you've suspected of committing a crime, but because they may believe that you have some information that may help them in their investigations. And if you refuse to cooperate, you can be imprisoned for up to five years. You've done nothing wrong. Under the Australian law, under the National Crime Commission, you can be called in at any time to be questioned regarding what they think is organised crime. And if you refuse to cooperate, you can be jailed for up to five years. So although you're a, a felon who's been charged with a heinous crime, murder, rape, you know, whatever, you can plead, you know, uh, silence. But as a member of a CFMEU, as an ordinary citizen, you can't plead silence. And it gets worse. The Attorney General has the power, the Federal Attorney General, to ban any organisation he or she feels like at any time because they think they may be a threat to Australia's interests. Under the current anti-terror legislation, you can occupy a building and be jailed for up to 20 years for the simple act of occupying a building, whether there is no violence or not. Now, there are so many uh, laws that have now been put in place which really restrict the ability. For example, this group here, the Wednesday Action Group, where I'm standing now is illegal. This is private property. The county court up the road, private property, it is illegal. It is rented out by the government. Federation Square, 
you've got an authority which runs it on behalf of the state government. Although the state government, we paid for it through our taxes, you can't demonstrate in Federation Square about a permit. You can't stand outside Southern Cross Station. You've only got 90 centimetres of footpath. The rest is privatised. So, under the Australian Constitution, we have minimal, if any, rights. For example, as I said before, the Attorney-General can ban any organisation he or she feels has been advised could pose a potential threat. And if you're a member of that organisation, you can be jailed for up to 25 years. And if you finance that organisation, you can be jailed for up to 25 years. So all those Australians who somehow think that they have all these freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of silence, there are no freedoms under the Australian Constitution. For example, the High Court ruled 15 years ago that, it, that an asylum seeker in Australia can be detained indefinitely for life. Indefinitely for life. We now have legislation which allows the federal government, is the federal government, these are all legislation passed in the last 10 years, to send the army into Melbourne at any time they believe there's a perceived threat without an invitation from the state government and if they cause any property damage or injure or kill anybody in that intervention they are indemnified from legal action. Again, I don't think most Australians realise how little freedoms. We have very few freedoms in comparison to the United States of America. In America they have the freedom to carry a gun, they have the freedom of speech, they have the freedom to remain silent, but none of, those, none of those freedoms exist. And it was a conscious decision at the end at the end of the 19th century, in the 1890s, not to incorporate those freedoms into the Australian Constitution because they believed that that may be that would uh, scuttle the plans for federation. Now it gets worse. The Constitution is the document we all live under. The only people who can change the Constitution, put a question to the people, is the members of Parliament. You need a majority in the House and the Senate and the House of Representatives to put a question to the people in a referendum. The people in this country have no mechanism by which they can raise questions to be put to the Australian people. In Switzerland, and in many states in the United States of America, if 10% of people demand that a particular question be put to a referendum, that question has to be put to the referendum. And if it succeeds, then that, uh, those ideas become incorporated into their constitution. So in this country, we have no real power to change the constitution. We have very few powers to change the constitution. So we are stuck with this outdated document which has no freedom of speech, no freedom of association, no protection for the individual from the arbitrary exercise of state power. And in 1998, I stood in a referendum on the question of a new constitution for a new millennium. Obviously, we have failed miserably. But the only way you can actually change this constitution is through revolt is by suspending the constitution and working out a new principles of association. Because all a constitution is the principle of association which governs society. So that's why it's important when a government is in power that it appoints high court judges which reflect its ideological opinions. Because you've got what's called black letter law where the judges, as they did in section 43 with the right to stand as a parliamentarian, interpret the Constitution literally, and then you've got other situations like the Marbo case in 1992, where the judges, majority of judges, interpreted the Constitution in a more liberal manner, which allowed the fiction of terra nullius to disappear from the legal statute books. So this is, this is the court. So if you want to uh, launch a, a constitutional challenge, which I've thought about over the years, I've only got to the Supreme Court, haven't got past that. You need a few million dollars. 
and you've got to come here and argue your case after you've gone through all the paperwork before a single judge. And if he or she thinks it's got a worth, it's got merit, well then you're allowed to argue it in the High Court. But the dilemma is, if I took the idea of compulsory voting, which I believe is unconstitutional, and I've argued this up to the Supreme Court in Victoria, if I took this to the High Court, every state government, the federal government, every local council would have a QC and assistance at that case. And as I was told many years ago by somebody in authority, you take to this High Court and I'll get a QC to carry my, my QC's hand luggage to the court and we will bankrupt you. So, in terms of change to the constitutional arrangements, unless there is a large mass movement which pushes the parliamentary majority to put the question to the people in a referendum, the chances of change are minimal. Now, if you don't believe me, if you think this is a little bit of hype, I suggest you look at the anti-terrorist legislation, 254 bills. You look at the legislation governing freedom of speech. You look at the, you look at the Constitution and see how little wiggle room there is for the individual. Legally, if a majority of both Houses of Parliament decided to pass legislation to imprison every blue-eyed two-year-old because they were Satan's spawn, they could legally do it. The Constitution doesn't even protect the innocent. Thank you for listening. Have a look at the Constitution. It's available on the net. And I suggest you read it. Think about it. I mean, you read, you read your lease arrangements, you read your mortgage arrangements, you read your constitutional arrangements because they determine what type of society we live in, what we can do and what we can't do in a legal frame.